guys, and welcome back to the Publishing by the Numbers podcast. It is mid-June, which means now we've gone from, because I have to give you guys a weather update just because it's funny. Now we've gone from too cold to about right, and now we're headed into summertime, wherein I am going to melt into a small pile of sticks. Because this is Utah heat, so it's dry heat. So it, it, it's not the melting that you get in Houston or something like this. This is the sun is going to dry your skin up and bleach your bones. Because that's where I live, and I love it. Um, but mid-June, this is episode 35. Today we are going to be talking YA fantasy with Jody Milner and CJ Anaya. And one of those names should be really familiar to everybody. Today, I am not here with any co-hosts because I have now made my co-host an interviewee, and Virginia is off doing something else. I am sure that we will find out what kind of something else soon. It'll be interesting. It always is. But we'll get right into introductions instead. So I have two amazing YA fantasy writers with me today. I have Jody Milner. Hi, Jody. Hello. And I have CJ Anaya. Hello, CJ. Hi, guys. And I'm going to read their bios first, and then we'll get into the meat of our discussion today, which is mostly going to be me interviewing the two of them and seeing what they come up with. I love these. These are my very favorite podcasts because they get to do all the work, and I just get to ask all the things that I've ever wanted to know. And, and it makes me happy. So, but let's give them background. Jody L. Milner is the author of the award-winning fantasy trilogy, The Shadow Barrier Trilogy. Um, it is very, very good. I know I edited it. When not chasing daydreams or her children, she enjoys destroying movie plots, making amigurumi, and plotting to take over the world, which I, for one, sign up to be one of her minions. That would be fine by me. Uh, CJ Anaya is a USA Today bestselling and award-winning author of The Healer and, and also Paranormal Misfits, which I think we are going to talk about today, and writes teen and young adult fantasy romance. However, she li- she ha <laughs> However, she tends to tell stories within the genre she loves to read. So you can find her sweet romantic comedies of the billionaire variety under the pen name Cynthia Savage and her super steamy, and it is way super steamy, guys, sci-fi romances under the pen name Angelina Avery. Her personal life can best be described as a mix between the rebooted TV series One Day at a Time and Dog with a Blog. Her four fabulous children tackle the extraordinary on a daily basis, while the family dogs Spike, the pug with an attitude, Lily, Chihuahua, Mix, who could seriously care less, and Grizzly, Pomeranian on crack, continually remind them all that they run the household. Thanks for coming, ladies. I am really excited about this. I'm excited, too. We're excited. Everyone's excited. This is going to be fun. We're so excited. Okay, no no singing. No singing. (laughs) All right. So last week we introduced the idea of fantasy as a genre. Um, and as we mentioned, then fantasy is big. So it, it's really big. There's a lot of subgenres. And so over this month, we're going to interview some authors from some of those subgenres. We will be back and we will revisit yet more of them because, much like romance, it will take us that long to visit all of these subgenres. But it's lots of fun to do that because. You never know where you're going to find your next favorite. And some of these subgenres are things that you may not have heard of or that we haven't dabbled in. So it's always finding something new to write, to read, or to enjoy. So here we're focused on YA fantasy. And CJ, what do you think is YA fantasy? What makes something a YA fantasy versus a any other kind of fantasy? Oh, okay. So YA fantasy, for me, it's really all about escapism, I think. I mean, you can escape into a lot of different uh, teen and young adult books, but with YA fantasy, um, you get that that magical, um, that otherworldly uh, adventure, I would say, uh, where you are discovering and exploring new worlds and you are creating these really cool magic systems um, and all of these really powerhouse young people are getting to grow into their own, I guess you could say. So there's a lot of coming of age in this. And there tends to be that uh, really in a lot of these teen and young adult books. But within fantasy, you get to see that happen um, in ways that you don't get to see in other genres, because it's, it's, again, it's, you're putting your teens in situations that obviously they're not going to be put in, in a real life scenario, uh, at least not with magic popping around. So uh, I just, I love it. I love it. And I think it's wonderful. So yeah. Fantastic. Oh, Miss Jody, why do you write YA fantasy? What, what puts you on this path that says, I want to write about teenagers? <laughs> well, that's a tough one. Like, 
if I'm going to choose to read something, usually it's just like, I don't, Ooh, that's angsty. Oh my gosh. No. And then I'm just like, <laughs> when I'm going to write it, it's just like, Oh my goodness, the quirky opportunities and the awkward situations and all these del delicious little tidbits where you're like, if I was a teen, I'd get in so much trouble, but this would be so much fun. So like, if I was going to copy paste CJ's answer, like it's the escapism and it, it's this, it's this world where these teens have a lot more power and influence and opportunity than I think any any normal standard teen I should hope to have. Um, and so it's it's just darn right fun. Yeah, exactly. We're good with fun, but fun I think should be a part of anything that you write. If it's not fun, then why? Are, you know, the the only reason to write things that aren't fun is if there's a really big paycheck assigned to it. <laughs> but I'm thinking some of my technical writing. It was not fun, but they you know paid me a paycheck that had several zeros on it, and they were on this side of the decimal point. So I I, I will write for food. It's true, but this kind of writing we we also want it to be fun. So we've talked about um, that it's it's YA. So in YA, we're generally talking about younger characters, characters that are in their uh, teens, sometimes up to their their uh, young twenties, but most of the time we push them on that side of twenty and about this side of thirteen. Um, that's when we're talking about these. It's usually what we're talking about in YA. So when you're writing characters, and this is going to go to both of you. Um, what kind of things do you consider when you're you're putting together a, a YA protagonist? What what are some of your must-haves? What makes them interesting? What 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 do you do when you're starting a story and you're gonna say, okay, this is who I'm gonna write about? How how does that work for you? And we'll go back to CJ. We're just gonna go back and forth between the two like a ping pong game. Okay, that sounds like fun. Um well when I when I wrote the Healer series, I, so I'm going to pull it back to me because uh, it's all about me, really. <laughs> okay, Isn't so that all teenagers? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that explains everything we write about right? I think, I think we can end this right now with me now. <laughs> no, I think it's because you write what you know. You write what you've experienced. You, you look back on the things that you struggled with. And I think that even in your 30s and your 40s and probably 50s and 60s and 70s, and it, you feel like a teen. I think you feel young. And I think you still look back at that and you experience things where you go, I want to write about this because it's important because these events touched my life. Right. And so that's the type of thing that I use when I am creating a character. So for me, when I was writing the healer, I was dealing with cancer. Right. And in my mind, I was thinking, I know that if I could harness this ability to heal, it would be awesome. And then I started thinking about energy healing. And then I started thinking about, you know, different teens that I had run into who were experiencing illness the way that I had, but they were experiencing it young and the way that they were approaching that, right? And so for me, the character Hope became this girl who had a lot of power and a lot of responsibility, but also was trying to navigate all of that that shouldn't be put on anyone, you know, uh, when they're a teen, as a teen. Um, and, and how do you look at that responsibility and how do you not abuse that power when you have this ability to connect with someone's life force and, and help them, teach them how to heal certain aspects of their body? Um, what if they're meant to die? And you say no. Uh, no, you're going to live. And then you're messing with laws of nature. So uh, these were things that I wanted to explore. I wanted to explore this idea of choices having consequences. I wanted to explore this idea of flawed characters learning from their mistakes. Um, and I wanted to really, I wanted to make a character that was very relatable to young adults, but also that was going to be relatable to adults who had gone through these very similar things. So for me, when it comes to crafting a character, who is a teen, it's a lot of me. It's a lot of dumb, really, because there was so much dumb that happened when I was a teen. And so a lot of dumb and a lot of learning. Um, and because those are my experiences, that is what I tend to create. And also what I hope to be like, even still, the type of person that I hope to be like, I, all of the best of what I would want to be, I want to put in that character. But, you know, you can't make them too perfect, dang it. So there's a lot of the flaws as well. So that that's that's what I try to do. Marvelous. Jody. what goes into your process? Oh, goodness. Well, Jana can attest to my struggle in creating a good um, protagonist that's a teenager. I, I suffered from the Mary Sue 
problem like so bad like in these first in in the first books and probably like I think I learned my lesson after Janet went through two books with me where I'm like my main character can't solve all the problems with everything she's got like she can't do that that is super unrealistic for that to happen and so I I I struggled for a really long time to capture um, my main character as a teenager and I think the biggest problem was my my original go 10 years ago when I'm like let's write a book um, this book was like going to be a, a book for an adult audience it was going to be like with these immortals as a main character and and so when I had to rewind and be like but the story the heart of this story is with this teenage character and someone flagged me on it you know my dear test reader she's like by the way <laughs> do you know that your story is not about this dude that you've invested so much time in it's actually about his daughter I'm like huh huh okay and so it's been a real struggle because like I feel like I'm still technically like 16 like 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 when I have to go pay my taxes I'm like I shouldn't have to do this I'm too little <laughs> And, you know, all of these adulting things, like setting up your own doctor's appointments. I'm too little. I don't want to. <laughs> um, and so, like, I, I still feel very much in that I don't want to grow up. I want to just stay in this youthful whimsy and where everything is kind of beautiful and fun and magical. And when the real world disrupts that idea, I get very cranky. Um, thank heavens for audiobooks and ebooks where you can escape even when you're grocery shopping. Because, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> um so yeah I can't say I have a really good process of creating these teenage characters although I feel like I'm getting better at it through a lot of trial and error um and and being educated of of the dumb things that I've done and then not doing those mistakes again and so now as I'm approaching a new project I'm like I'm going to really seize this opportunity and I'm going to and I'm, now I have teenagers in my home I'm like huh I have this perfect opportunity to really gather in all of these you know the quirky angst and all of this like flippant behavior and like the I don't want to listen to you right now because I'm cranky and hun hungry and I and I just need a little bit of a snack and a nap and then I'll be you know human again so so I my answer is I'm a work in progress <laughs> I see no problem with that. I, I think every, and any author who says that they're done learning stuff is fooling themselves. You know, all, all the best authors I know will always say, oh, I'm still learning stuff that's part of my process, that is part of, you know, this, this latest book went completely differently than my first ones did, and that's all good. So we're moving forward. So th this is a fun one. I, I really like my list of questions. This one's going to be on magic because you both have uh, magical systems within your books. Um, so what are tips that you would give to people about developing magical systems and making them work in your book so that they don't feel either way overpowered or like kind of just a sideline? How do you make them important and yet make them make sense? And Jody, I know you just finished talking, but I'm going to go to you anyway, because I can. I, I enjoy I'm being the boss. I'm in complete, I am I am so in love with magic and magic systems because I swear that's the only reason I read fantasy is to see what the magic can do. Um, and so I think when you approach a mag magic system, first you have to decide, is this going to be like a very soft, whimsical magic that doesn't really have rules and it just kind of happens and fuzzy little bunnies pop out of the air and it's and, and it it doesn't have real substance to it. Or is this going to be a Sanderson magic where it's just like, we have these rules and thou shalt not break the rules and the rules, like, it's important to have the, like, the structure is important to the story and the magic itself is creating um, part of the storyline itself because it's, it's that much part of the story. So I think when you're going to approach it, that's a big decision you have to make first because there's not a ton of middle ground, although you can kind of fuzz the lines at some points, but the more strict you make your magic, 
the more rules you do have to create to uphold that magic and you're not allowed to break them um my my magic system tends to be very rule structured but i'm a free spirit and i'm just like i'll just kind of figure it out as i go please don't do that we i will save you so much time and 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 hassle and heartache and pain and editing um saying sit down with yourself and create like figure out where the power comes from and figure out like what it costs the user and figure out who gets to use it um like you really do need to have that pinned down. And then if it has any sort of visual element to it that's consistent, you really want to get that pinned down because the last thing you wanna do is when you're writing and you're having a great time and you're in the flow and you need the magic and then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, I haven't figured out how this particular part works or heaven forbid, should you do this, we're gonna hunt you down not literally but if you do the thing where it's just like i'm going to solve this little problem that's popped up with a magic we haven't seen before yeah your readers will come after you with pitchforks because it's cheating and thou shalt not do it i'm gonna pass the baton over to cj now <laughs> or i'm gonna oh. pass it back to Jana. oh you no, you touched on some good ones. Um, I think, and and I think I kind of want to explore that idea of you know magic just popping up, um, out of nowhere. Um, man, I've seen. It, I think that the danger when it comes to magic systems that I have learned is I want. Um, sometimes I lean a little too heavy on what's convenient. So rather than trying to make these conflicts and these obstacles and these things that these characters go through, um, difficult to navigate, you know, it's like if you give them the ability to be invisible or to disappear or, and then they can just like transport away from the conflict, you know, uh, the, there are just certain things where it's like, ah, oh, that was an easy out. I really wanted to see you tackle this and figure out how, you know, to, to use your magic either effectively or just not use it at all and think of something else. Because sometimes there, there needs to be, I guess you say kryptonite to the magic, you know, there needs to be something where it's, you're not just all powerful. The character is not all powerful and is just going to, whatever magic they have can, can break things and fix things and end things. Um, that was hard for me because I wanted easy fixes, even though as a reader, that's not what I want. But as a writer, I'm like, that's hard. Nah, I want an easy fix. I think there just needs to be, um, a limit. There needs to be limitations to magic. Like how far can you take it? And then don't break the rules. You know, like Jody said, don't break the rules. That's naughty. So, um, I know that you both write super interesting, um, female led books. That was really, really choppy. Sorry about that. Hi guys. I just finished eating an Oreo. And so it really threw off my, my train of <laughs> stuff. Uh -huh, I'll blame it on anyway. The Oreo. <laughs> anyway, so you both write uh, female driven stories and why, why do you think that that's important in YA fantasy? Um, because we see a lot of it. We, we see a lot of YA fantasy. For, for years and years, it was driven by mostly stories about boys. And one of the things that we've seen that's been a change has been more and more of these YA fantasies where they're driven by girls. And so why did you guys choose female characters? What do you think makes them strong characters, makes them the kind of role models? Or are they even role models? Or is it just that teenagers want to read books that about people who are like them? Why, why girls? and go CJ. Um, I think for me, it had everything to do with some of the ways in which I was raised and I wanted a little more. I wanted to see uh, within, I'd watched too many TV shows and I'd read too many books where I was waiting for the girl to do something, <laughs> do something, dang it. Uh, and, and there were so many opportunities where she could have and she didn't. And I was waiting for it to happen. And so because I, you know, obviously relate to females a little more and I know what's in my heart when it comes to what I want to accomplish and what I felt I couldn't when I was growing up, what what I felt my path was and that I was stuck with it and couldn't deviate. Um, I think it was just so fun for me to explore this idea of the female being the hero and the female making the tough choices. Um, and especially a young teenage girl actually believing um, herself capable 
of specific tasks and specific problems being solved. Um, I think that there is a place in literature and in you know genre fiction for women to be saved, but I also think there's also a place for women to be saving themselves uh, and saving other people. And so I wanted to bring out a lot of those strengths. And also it's, it's fun to read books about dudes who are doing cool things. But for me, there's a part of that that I cannot relate to. When I you know see a teenage girl doing the miraculous, I sit there and I think I could do that too. And I remember having a moment uh, in high school, reading books, uh, enjoying the process, but then finding, for me, I'm always going to go back to Nancy Drew, even though this is mystery and I get it. I know it's totally different. And everyone's like, Nancy Drew's lame. And I was like, no, Nancy Drew is not lame. Nancy is smart. She's intelligent. She solves problems. She makes connections. She gets the bad guys. She helps people. And she's super kind and feminine while doing it, which is cool too. I like that. And, you know, wearing fancy dresses. Cause I, I got all of those, the, the Nancy Drew books that had the covers where she was totally 40s, 50s decked out, you know, and I was like, man, she's kicking ass with heels on and I want to do it too. Nice. So, you know, for me, that was really inspirational. And I thought more girls needed that. If that was what helped me, that was what would help other girls who maybe didn't believe in themselves. So that that's my very long explanation. Girl power. Yay. I so am going to put the phrase kicking ass with heels on, on a t-shirt at some point, because that is just the best catchphrase for this entire thing. It's a new graphic tee for sure. I love it. Jody. anything you want to add there? I have the same Nancy Drew set. It has the yellow covers, right? With the blue titles. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. We oh. are friends. I, I, I told you, you guys be. would get along. I knew I liked you. Oh, I'm Yay. So As for the battle battle wedges no uh i i am a fan of jill barrop and she talks about um stop putting women in wedge wedge heels for armor stop it like a little lift is okay but no battle wedges are ridiculous it's for your balance off okay sorry tangent we're coming back uh we're talking about female protagonists <laughs> um so when it comes to why I wanted to do um, a female dri driven story is a lot like what CJ said, where growing up, like I was a voracious reader because I was an awkward human. So I, I escaped where everyone was kind of nice to each other, except for when they really weren't, but you understood why. Um, and like, and that was safe and that was nice. And so like my refuge was reading really big books. And I loved finding books that did have female heroines who hopefully started out a little awkward and then they grew into these people who were really quite incredible I'm just like oh, there's hope for my awkward soul did I think that as a teen probably not looking back as an adult I'm just like oh yeah oh yeah that shaped me of having these these fantastic uh female dread uh driven fantasies um do you remember like hero in the crown I oh, think that's I uh, love Robin it. Rob McKinley Robin McKinley uh, one of my very favorites because it had um, a main character I could empathize with and be like, I could be that person in that story and doing all those things. And that would be just, you know, amazing. Mm -hmm. And it gave me hope that, you know, one day I'm going to step into myself and it's going to be great. Tell me when that day comes because I'm waiting for it. Um, but it's it's that resonance. It's that uh, relatability. Like, the first time they put a redheaded person in Star Wars, like I cheered so loud because it says it's um, Emphis Nest. If I said that wrong, please don't come after me because I don't have notes in front of me. But she has this gorgeous red hair that's like huge and big and poofy. And, and she's this powerful leader of this, you know, this whole community. I'm just like, oh, a woman with power in Star Wars? Drink! it's not going to happen again um it's okay we had ray they gave us ray and then the producer for the next one of the newer ones came out and they tried to cast natalie portman again and that wasn't natalie portman that was the other guy no sorry tangent again i'm gonna come back to the plot the story what we're talking we're, about. we're doing great we're great i'm gonna fangirl just a smidgen Anyway, whenever I see someone that I can relate to in a position where they're not furniture, 
where they're not just being dragged around and where they're not just kind of there. Um, like my little heart is just like, yay. And it needs to happen more often. And so I want to put more of those out in the world because that's my little contribution to the problem. Fantastic. All right. Related to that, because I know this is also in both of your series, what role do you think romance has in YA fantasy? Because I occasionally see people who go, no, no, I, I want all the, the killing and the magic and all that kind of stuff and none of, none of this squishy stuff. So is romance there just for the girls or is there a purpose for having romance in YA fantasy? And who wants it? You, you can cage fight. Who goes first? So romance in fantasy and especially young adult fantasy I think it absolutely has a place because learning how to like other people, especially other people that it might be more than like, is part of the teenage experience. It's like, it's really unrealistic for people to be going through all of these things and they're with other people and not have their relationship change. Now, it might change for the worse, it might change for the better, but it's going to change and they're going to learn things about each other. And if that's not in the book, it feels like there's something missing. Now, should there be a lot of kissy squishy happening? Like that depends on what book you're writing. Um, if you want it to have more romancing, I know the teenage readers are like a lot of them really, really cheer for that because it makes their little hearts flutter and they love it. Um, and then there's the ones that don't love it and then they just avoid that. That's okay. Like there's a readership for both, but it feels unrealistic for having characters in situations where they don't have any sort of feelings for each other. So have I done a good job with this? Probably not. I could have done better, but, um, but I do, I'm learning. I'm learning how to make, you know, the things happen and it's just like, Oh, opportunity. This is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's hard. I, I think it's difficult to, it's difficult to create that level of chemistry between characters anyway, right? That's something you're trying to learn. Uh, but I think, uh, and I still struggle with it sometimes. Like I'll read through a scene that I've written and I'm like, I am so bored. And then I've got to rewrite it <laughs> because I know I haven't hit that note. But it's like Jody said, it's unrealistic to think that teens wouldn't be thinking about these things because I know, unfortunately, I thought about it all the time as a teen. It was ridiculous. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to, to stress in teen and young adult was this idea of the, the, I guess in the romance, what you both bring to the table. And I didn't realize this until you asked this question, Jana, but in both of my series, the, the romance can't happen. And the, the, the romance that they have facilitates some type of power, if that makes sense. So it actually solves some kind of end goal. So for me, it was important that equality played into that mix where it wasn't just like the damsel in distress where we're going back to, you know, who's saving who here. It's saving each other and saving yourselves, right? And so for, for Hope with her healing power, the goal really was that she was supposed to heal this veil between the living and the dead. That's what her healing power was meant for. She just transferred it to people because she didn't know what she was was doing but she couldn't do that without her significant half without her you know her if you want to say you know soulmate or fated mate and so you know with that comes learning each other and with that comes understanding what you bring to the table and why both of you are necessary um, instead of just one person taking the lead always in any situation, you're both solving those problems. And I did that again in um, Paranormal Misfits because the only way that they're able to get rid of this magical disease that is plaguing people is by by joining people's, you know, by connecting their heart stones to each other. And then that solves this loop of where power is being fed back and forth to each other. You're feeding and taking, feeding and taking. And that was part of the romance. And so basically, you know, joining people together as soulmates with their, the, those heart stones that they have that hold their magic. It was about that give and take of a relationship I did not realize I had done that until you asked that question. And now I'm going back and going, wow, are there things I can learn? <laughs> Dummy. But I just, I love what Jody said about the learning. You have to learn to like someone before you love them. You have to get to know people. And that, that stands true, whether it's soulmates or faded mates or, you know, I hate the insta lust. I know there's a place for it or the insta love. I get it. It's there, but it's too easy, especially with 
faded mate type of stuff to just go suddenly we're in love. And it's like, no, cause you might really hate that person at first. It doesn't matter if you're supposed to be together. Like you, I mean, what if they're loud? What if they irritate you? Like, how do you navigate certain things? So I think it's important to approach that because I don't, I, I never want a teen to just sit there and go happily ever after. It's like, no, this takes work. It all takes work. Right. So, yeah. All right, we're getting towards the end, but I still have a couple of questions. Um, we know that a lot of the folks who listen to our podcast are authors or up and coming authors, people who want to get into this whole publishing journey and all of those kinds of things. So if you had any one piece of advice to give to somebody who wants to do what you have done, who, who is just you know starting this path, what would be your advice for going through the process and being a published YA fantasy author. Go ahead, Jody. All righty. Um, a short snippet of advice. Go fight win. Um, <laughs> like, like you need to be eager and passionate about learning and doing and doing and learning and then learning and doing and then failing and then doing some more and learning. Um, if you're not in this constant cycle of I think I'm screwing up, then you're not pushing hard enough mm -hmm. because you're not going to figure out where the edges of your abilities are until you start pushing against them and it's uncomfortable. And that's where people stop. And, and so if you're feeling uncomfortable with it, that means you're about to experience growth. And so even though it's hard or awkward, sit down and make words. And when it feels hard, it means you're going to hit growth and just keep going. I love, I love that answer. That's a good answer. Um, I think to, to build on that, um, surround yourself with those people who have also done that and are still doing it. Right. Um, cause if you're going to hang out with folks who just whine and complain about the process rather than ever actually putting words on a page, you're going to sink yourself down into that level of, I'm going to whine and complain about the process and never put any words on a page. So yeah, surround your, yourself with people who are doing this, who are where you want to be and learn from them and figure out, you know, learn from their mistakes because they'll share them with you. This is a very friendly community of people who are like, so here's how I messed up and go. <laughs> and so, you know, just learn from that and continue that, that I, I it's that try fail cycle, right? Right. Jody, that, oh, yeah. that we put in the book. It's also what you're doing in real life. So get really good at that. And it'll make you even better with those try fail cycles in your books. Yay. <laughs> Well, okay, so since you brought it up, CJ, mm -hmm. what is one of the biggest mistakes you feel like you made in getting your first books out? What is oh. something where you just, you, you want to tell other people, I've made this mistake so that you don't have to make it? I got real prep. Well, there's so many. There's not just one. Just, it's all right. Just one. Okay. Two of them. I got real precious with my covers and knew not what I was doing. So I had all of these, you know, I was like, I'm going to capture a scene from my book. This is a common author mistake. Don't do it. So I was like, and go, and here's a hand and she's healing. And there's the face. And then, you know, you look at it now and I'm like, what was I thinking? Of course it didn't sell books. So don't get precious with your cover. Make sure you study your competitors so that your cover is beautiful and exactly what your audience expects it to be. Um, so that then they will buy it. The other thing that I did is I decided to tackle a, a four book series as a first time author, where we started in the present and then two of the books went to the past. This is dumb, dumb, dummy, dumb, dumb. Don't do that. I, I still struggle with having people do the read through. I mean, a lot of people say your second book actually should be your first book and they are probably right. Um, the first book is more of a setup to everything that happens for the rest of the series, but, but, you know, trying to navigate the ins and outs of, of the reincarnated princess in the present and then how she died in the past to get to the present um, the people have to be willing to come with me on that journey for that. And so some people do, but, but I don't know that I, if I were to go back and rewrite that entire series, I would have handled that differently. Um, just so that the reader expectation was a little bit more smooth. So pay attention to structure and pay attention to, you know, what is being done. Sometimes you can push that envelope, but if you're a newbie, like I was, don't, don't <laughs> do that. Not until you can. Okay. So that's my advice. 
All right, go ahead, Jody. I, I can right. see you're trying to dodge it. I, you cannot just shrink off the screen. You, you, you actually have to answer the question. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. Okay, so I had this belief when I first came out of the box that every epic fantasy needed to aim for at least 100,000 words. Like I, like, I carried that belief with me for like four years. I'm like, I need to make this story reach 100,000 words. And so I kept adding really random stuff to make it reach that. And so my my bit of advice is that your story is the length it needs to be. And if it ends up being really short, it can be a novella. Mm -hmm. It can be a different format. You don't you shouldn't feel like you need to add more or take away more unless you start getting where it's like 300,000 words and then maybe maybe you should talk to an editor about how to you know bring the words in but forcing a word count is not something you do until you have several books under your belt and you have kind of an idea of where the targets are supposed to be until you've got that kind of experience trying to be like oh yeah I'm going to be Brandon Sanderson and write this 400,000 word book and it's going to fly off the shelf because it's going to be the best epic fantasy that's ever been written. If that's the first thing you try to do out of the box, first of all, it's going to take you a very, 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 very long time because just the sheer amount of work to get that number of words on the page will take forever. Um, so don't have this idea that you need to reach a certain length because your story is going to do what it needs to do and you kind of need to trust that. All right, last question, and then we will roll into our moments of irrelevancy. This is an easy one, ladies. So, it's, it, but it's a two-parter because it's the last one. I, I get a long one. So, the question is, first of all, what are you working on next? What are you excited about? And second of all, where can we find all of the wonderful things that you've done before? And we will have you say them out loud, and then we'll also put the links in the show notes. And go ahead, Jody. All right, my next project is actually creating an omnibus of my trilogy, but it's going to have bonuses. So it's going to have a bonus no novel. It's going to have my novelette hiding inside it. And then I may or may not do an epilogue because I got a, a spicy, not a spicy, excuse me. <laughs> I, I got a very exciting idea um, that I think is going to just round out this, this universe of stories. Um, and so I'm very excited to get that taken care of. Uh, you can find me at my website, which is jodylmilner.com. That's Jody spelled with just an I. I'm a weirdo, I know. And then you can find me on most social media at Jody L. Milner author. So that would be on uh, Facebook and also on I am never on Instagram anymore, but it's there. Um, and those links are in the description. Fantastic. CJ, what you working on? Okay. So it's, well, I am definitely currently in the process of working on my third book in my sci-fi romance series, which obviously has nothing to do with teen and young adult. However, I've had a lot of angry people come after me because I left things open for spinoff series within the healer and also within paranormal misfits. So all of these secondary characters, they're kind of like, Hey, you kind of left that open. Are you going to do something about it? And I'm like, I've been meaning to for a good five years. So yes. Um, so right now it's sci-fi romance book because it's where my heart is and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Uh, but I do need to get back and write a, a book for, um, uh, a couple of characters in paranormal romance and also in my my or paranormal misfit series and in the healer series everybody wants Angie and I'm like I'm so sorry I know I'm sorry so I need to go back in and do that um, as far as where you can find me uh, author cjanaya.com and like Jody I'm on social media sites um, I even have a TikTok account that I am terrible at being consistent with like horrifically. However, there are a few funny little skits that I did with my kids because I was trying to convince them to read my books and they refused. And I thought that was funny. So I was like, let's do a skit about this. <laughs> so if you want to watch my kids say, no, mom, no. And then see me groveling. You could go on TikTok and look at that too. That might be fun. Uh, yeah. That's where you can find me. Yep. I, I know that there are, there are Oreos involved in one of those TikToks. Are. I, I do remember the Oreos. Many Oreos. So oh. many Oreos. Yum. 
All right, then let's launch into our very favorite, our moments of absolute irrelevancy. CJ, what is irrelevant in your world today? Do we have a pug story? Oh, no, not this time. Although oh. <laughs> it, I'm sure there will be more soon because he just, I mean, seriously. Uh, but no, I, I this is more of a things happening when you don't want them to happen. My AC pooped out on me, like right as we're hitting summer in Southern Arizona. And it, 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 uh, I am not a girl who likes the heat at all, at all. And so, and you're like, why'd you move to Southern Arizona? It's such a good question. Ask me later. That's a longer story. So I hate it so much. And when you get in the car, you're rolling the windows down, trying to get some air in, but it's all hot air. It's all hot air, which I'm full of anyway, but still it's all horrible. And so I finally got my AC fixed on Wednesday. But before that, like I had to drive to like an hour away in the heat. And by the time I got to where I was going, I was drenched, like just sweat everywhere. And I was like, I'm supposed to be eating food with friends and I have no deodorant with me. Not that I think at this point that would help. So it was really, uh, embarrassing and, um, Oh no. (laughs) Oh no. That's all. (laughs) But we are grateful for AC. Yes. AC all the way. It's fixed by the way. got it fixed yesterday. So. Jody, what is something irrelevant in your world? Oh man! So I, I am a fair weather gardener. Um, the second it gets above ninety-five, I do not want to be outside, which means my yard suffers a lot. And I'm still trying to reclaim it from last year's negligence, which is not my favorite. Um, and so, and I also suffer from uh, executive dysfunction. So, like, if I'm stressed about something, I will just turn into a paralyzed little, you know, I just can't work. Um, and all of a sudden, scrolling is really attractive. It's just like, what's next? And um, and that makes the little the little gremlins in my brain happy for you know five minutes, ten minutes at a time. We won't confess. And so I, yesterday was a bad dysfunction day because I had a couple things coming up. Not this, actually, because this is fun, but some other things. And so I was in this. And so I'm just like, today I'm going to be like uber productive. And so I got up and I got my kids out to school and I, and I got a work session. And I'm just like, I'm going to mow the lawn because I need to get that done. And I, I have my ear, my earbuds in, earpods, whatever they're called. And, um, and I'm listening to a podcast and it, it so kindly gives my my notifications. It's like, cha-ching, you have a message from Jana, Zoom link. (laughs) And my heart falls out. I'm like, was that today? And so it's like literally two minutes before we're supposed to get on this call. And I'm out in the middle of my front yard with a, a lawnmower and sweating bullets and so I drop everything throw the lawnmower back in the garage and I run down here with like my mascara in hand literally I'm like there's going to be a moment where I'm going to regret this if I don't um and so that was my my irrelevancy (laughs) it's just like Try so hard. By the way, you were glistening (laughs) there. I did not see a sweaty mess. You were, you were beautiful glistening and then you put on that makeup so fast and so expertly. So, um, I'm just saying zoom has filters, which is lovely. (laughs) And I may or may not take advantage of that. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. All right, Jana, what about you? Well, speaking of being a hot mess, um, So I'm dealing with a lot of back pain right now. And so that means that upon occasion, I get really nice drugs that make you kind of wee. Um, Nobody come to my house looking for them. My dog will eat you alive. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, so so I do occasionally take those when I absolutely need to. And and yesterday was one of those days I'd had it. And so so I took part of one of my pills and then I'm helping my daughter. We're making dinner and this, set and the other. And we decided to make pudding because there's, there's never a bad time for pudding. So I get everything out and we get everything all going and I'm putting things away as the pudding is bubbling and all is well. And then my daughter asked me something and I turned around to put something away and I look up in the cupboard and there's the milk. And, and I have no idea how long it's been up there, probably at least since I started making the pudding. In because, the cupboard? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because 
in in my <laughs> diluted state, I apparently because I had a measuring cup that I had just poured the milk with, and then I rinsed it and dried it out and set it down. But in my brain, something still needed to go back in the cupboard. And so I picked up the milk and I put it in the cupboard and walked away. And like I say, only, only later did I look in the cupboard and go, huh, that 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 doesn't belong up there. And I'm pretty sure I'm the one that put it there. <laughs> so I'm just grateful that it's not one of those that I left it up there for a week or something where it would have been really, really gross. It, that this was only like 20 minutes or whatever. But yeah, that, that was my moment of irrelevancy was milk in the cupboard instead of the refrigerator. I think that needs to be a catchphrase now, right? You know, how's your day been going? Well, it's, it's all been it's, milk in the cupboard. Yeah, it's, it's all been just, milk in the cupboard. See? All been milk in the cupboard. Yeah. See, there, there's another t-shirt for us, milk in the cupboard day. <laughs> because it's sometimes that way. Sometimes that is just the way that life works. And yesterday that was, yeah, it was totally a milk in the cupboard day. And and that's okay because sometimes it happens and and I got it out in time and we still had the pudding and we had tacos and all was well. All right, ladies, thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a great time. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk to both of you again soon. Well, you know, CJ is going to become a host again, so we'll we'll definitely talk to her again. But Jody, we'd love to have you back. It's been wonderful, and keep us abreast of what you're doing so that we can share with everybody else because there's exciting dealings going on. And as for our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. You can find the show and the show notes at www.elantumdigital.com and follow the podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast distributor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye now. Bye, guys. Bye.